Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is March 4th, 2024, and we are really honored and humbled uh, and grateful to have back on our show today, Jesse Hildebrandt. Hey, Jesse. Hi. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's it's uh, it's my pleasure. Um, I'm sure those who uh, are joining us know who you are, but for those who don't, um, Jesse Hildebrandt is uh, Jesse Hildebrandt goes by they them pronouns. Jesse uh, is the do you say niece? What do you say? Uh, yeah, I mean the one of the terms is nibbling, but you can you can use niece. It's fine. Okay, nibbling your niece to uh, to Jody Hildebrandt, who obviously. Uh, not only was arrested and charged with uh, uh, multiple counts of child abuse, but recently has been sentenced uh, to at least four years in prison and potentially, I think, up to 30. Uh, but, yeah. oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, no, it was, I mean, according to the charges, up to 60, but because she is a first-time offender, it's uh, like the maximum is 30 years. Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, so Jesse, as most of you will know, uh, they came on Mormon Stories podcast several months back and told their their experiences uh, experiencing abuse um, by their niece, by, by their aunt, uh, Jody. And it was a really important episode. Uh, uh, it was meaningful to so, so many people. Hundreds of thousands, if not over a million views, I forget, but it's certainly been a well-watched episode, impacted many people. And since then, uh, Jody Hildebrandt's story, along with Ruby Frankie's, the um, eight passengers' mom, who also uh, was imprisoned and uh, found guilty and pled guilty. Uh, since then, um, the story's taken the nation by storm. Several news outlets have covered this story nationally, internationally. I think of at least a few documentaries are in the works. Um, but most importantly, uh, for our audience, I think there's just a lot of people that care uh, about um, you, Jesse, and who are just really eager to um, know how you're doing, to learn about uh, how things have gone for you since telling your story. And then there's a lot of people that have questions about your resilience um, how, how you've, um, how this has been for your health and for your healing and recovery. And I know that you, Jesse, uh, really wanted to talk about healing and growth as a major, um, emphasis for today, as well as talking about your thoughts on all the legal stuff that's happened and maybe other legal stuff that could still happen. So without any further ado, uh, Jesse Hildebrandt, welcome back. To Mormon Thank, you. Podcast. Thank you for having me again. Okay, so where I I have ideas of where to begin, but I want you to kind of lead wherever you want to lead. So, are there any are there any things you want to say uh, up front or share? I mean, the after effect of coming on the show the first time was, I mean, to, uh, the risk of sounding dramatic, life changing. I mean, the the amount of stories and messages that I have received, thousands and thousands of messages of people, unfortunately, relating to my experience. And it's just been such a humbling and beautiful experience. I feel so surrounded and so supported in ways that I didn't know were possible. So thank you to everyone that has listened to me ramble for three hours in the last episode <laughs> and uh for everyone that has yeah been so supportive and has been interested in this and um curious and and enraged by this i'm i'm uh, i like you said i'm sad and happy to hear that so many people reached out because even though we don't want to know that or believe that abuse is so ubiquitous we know that it is especially within a mormon context yeah and uh so when people can give voice to those who have been abused and uh and and or receive comfort or inspiration that's a good thing so yeah it's uh the amount of stories that were 
some of them very, very similar. And just, I mean, I couldn't read them all. It was, there's so many and I, I couldn't respond to them all. I, I, when I had said on the previous episode, I'm like, yes, my inbox is open, please. I had no idea what I was getting into. I had no idea how many people would, you, I had no context or concept of like what that interview was going to be or what it was going to be like afterwards. Um, but know that anyone that did reach out and if I didn't respond, know that like it still meant so much to me. Yeah. There comes a point where you just can't, you literally physically can't respond to everything. Yeah. I've, been, I, I've never experienced anything like that. <laughs> well, um, I, one of my, I have to say one of my favorite moments in the entire episode was when we shared uh, your Venmo uh, account <laughs> and people started donating uh, to your Venmo account. Uh, that made me really happy, but I also loved plugging your tattoo Um expertise you do tattoos in yeah. seattle and then you say you know you mentioned that you sometimes come to salt lake do, do you mind just sharing a little bit about uh if people did come to get uh tattoos from you and if so any stories or experiences you want to tell about that yeah it's been it's been so just shattering in the best way like everyone that has been so generous and so supportive and so kind and I have had people come out and get tattooed and it's been just so surreal. Like the first couple of times it happened, it was just like, it's, it's so bizarre in like the best way of like knowing these people know this part of me in such like a, such a personal way, but I don't know them really. At all. It's just, it's a very strange, surreal experience, but um, every person that I've tattooed that has found me, via Mormon stories has been just such a delight. It's been so incredible. And it it the world is so small and connective. And it, even though social media has, you know, it's a love-hate relationship, I think for most of us, the way that it connects it connects us is just so beautiful. Did did were there like Mormon themed tattoos or just just I did <laughs> one of them that was that was Mormon themed was uh, I did a queer, like, lesbian pilgrim <laughs> couple <laughs> that was, like, you know, like, very, like, FLDS hairstyles and stuff. That was really fun and blasphemous. <laughs> but, yeah. That's fun. There was there's this one woman that has come in multiple times. I absolutely adore her. It was her first tattoo, and she had recently left the church. And I think it was, I think it's been healing for both of us. She's probably around my mom's age and has just been so maternal and like very, very healing to be able to like experience that connection with her. So it's been, it's been really, really amazing. Well, we'll, we'll have you mention uh, your, if you want, you know, we're again, we'll have you mention the end where you do tattoos and if people want to visit, did you ever come to Salt Lake or not yet? I haven't yet. Okay. No, it, it hasn't worked out in the in my scheduling so far, but I, I want to soon. Okay. All right. Well, if you want, maybe one place we can go next is just to talk about uh, the, the legal process as it relates to, I don't know, the state of Utah and, yeah. and Ruby and Jody and kind of if you want to take us back to after their arrest, yeah. uh, what you know, what your thoughts are, what your experiences were and how that ride was for you um, through the, whatever statements they made through whatever came out in the press all the way up to their semi sentencing, which is not totally completed yet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the sentencing is a joke. I was, it was really after that came out. And when I realized that that's like what Utah legally does is like push off second degree felonies onto parole boards it's so enraging. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been a roller coaster for sure. Um, very, very emotional in, in, in both positive and very painful ways. Um, it's very strange and surreal to be, I think I've said this before, but to be so overwhelmed by something that is also so validating and vindicating because 
and so healing, but um, um, I was just doing an interview earlier today and something that kind of came to mind is this like image of healing is also incredibly painful. Like surgery is kind of the easy part. You know, you're in an anesthetic, you're not really conscious, you're the thing, you know, like the surgery is happening, but then the after, the aftercare is where the pain is. Um, so there was, there's been a lot of reprocessing um, through this trial and through, or through the, I guess it didn't go to trial, but through all of this, um, hearing Jody's lawyer when she, when she pled guilty, when her lawyer came out and made that statement, it was, it made me, it made me sick, honestly, to hear her quoted saying that she loved those children and that she only wanted those kids to focus on healing and that they hope she wishes them well. And it was just such a slap in the face and just so enraging. And I thought it was the thing that also made it so enraging is like, to me, it was such an obvious scam. It was so like, obviously like her just trying to be manipulative to like, I don't know, seize onto any sort of like story of remorse that she can so that the parole hearing will go or like at this point, the, the, the sentencing will go um, as easy as possible. But then I had people in my family message me that were shocked by that statement. And they had to think long and hard about whether or not, like what they felt about it. And to think that people in my family that know her, that know how deranged and harmful and destructive she is, if they are almost fooled by that, thinking about all the other people in the world that could also be fooled by that was just terrifying to me. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the most um, common questions I received for you, Jesse, is people saying, well, once Jody was arrested, once you came out with your story, once there would have been lots of opportunities for your parents, for your siblings, for extended family to both know your story in, in depth if they didn't, but also to, to be, to have your story somewhat vindicated by the judicial process. Yeah. Did any reach out to you, apologize, validate, um, you, you know, any of that? What, what's, what was your family's response? And there's going to be, multifacets i'm sure to your family's mm -hmm. response what are you wanting to share about the various family responses you may have received both from your mormon stories interview larger media interviews and then just the judicial potential validation i guess sure yeah um i mean it's been um this has probably been the most painful aspect of this whole process um I mean, I've had 14, almost 15 years to, to talk in therapy about Jody, but to continuously relive this part of me of like my parents still to this day not showing up, that's been, the, that's been I think, the hardest thing to process. Um, my parents still have not contacted me about this at all. Um, they've sent me a happy birthday text on my birthday last month, um, as if nothing happened as if the last mm -hmm. eight, seven, eight months have not occurred at all. Um, which is very, you know, on par for this, you know, the silencing culture, this culture of pretending like nothing is happening this disempowered culture. <clears throat> um, I've had a couple cousins reach out and um, apologize and show solidarity. Um, I've had a, a couple siblings in various degrees um, apologize and and su show some su show support. I mean, it's it's so complicated because it's not like. <laughs> I wish it could just be like, oh, in this moment, everything is healed. But everything that led to this moment, all of the, you know, 14 years of behavior and familial culture that has 
allowed for this to happen doesn't just go away overnight. And this very, and I'm sure you are very aware, like within the, this patriarchal familial structure of, uh, you know, the, the nuclear family is everything. Um, parents are everything. Honor thy mother and thy father. Um, I think it's very comp I think it's very difficult for my siblings to know how to navigate this. I mean, this is kind of my own interpretation of it, but I don't know if they know exactly how to proceed with that. Um, but I know that they, at least a couple of them are, are trying in their way. It is a little bit, I guess, mind boggling as a parent to think about not trying to get together to try and show up for you, show support for you, apologize, mend and heal. Yeah. It's hard to imagine not showing up for your kid. I mean, I think it, I, I don't really understand my father very well. Um, I have less empathy for him, but for my mom, um, and understanding being conditioned female, especially within a high demand religion, the disempowerment that women face within those structures is just so immense. And so I have a lot more sympathy for my mom and a lot more grace, like patience for her. Um, but if she were to admit and come to me now and, and support me in this, that what that would entail is to then admit 14 years of backlogged behavior and invalidation that she participated in, not to mention all of the things that she allowed to happen and okayed. And I, the depth of shame that the Mormon church just thrusts upon people, up, up, upon people in general and upon women is just so immense that I don't know if my mom has the capacity or the space to even begin that process. I think that she is born and bred into that the culture of put on the blinders, act like everything is fine, no matter what. And I mean, she has, how old am I? 31. She's 61 years of that, you know, like she is, that's a lot of deprogramming and a lot of deconditioning and re relearning. And the, the, I mean, I, I don't have children. Um, I know my mom is not a vicious person. I know she's not a malicious person. And I, I can't imagine the shame that she would be feeling. And I, so I think from how I, how I make it make sense in my head is that this is just the safest. I mean, it's incredibly disappointing and incredibly, I mean, it's, it's devastating to me. Um, I, I just did an interview um, early, like I said earlier today, and in preparing for that, I've already done one interview with with these with this news program, um, but this one has felt scarier, and I realized that, like, the fact that my parents have not contacted me or I, like that whole feels so much more um, painful than anything else. So, mm. uh, I mean, Mormon, this is not a, a, an uncommon experience within the Mormon community, within any, within any high demand religion, you know, this casting away of children that do not fit within the mold, that do not fit within these confines of what it means to be Mormon, a, a religion of perfectionism. And for so many people, their, their shame and their, their guilt and their wounds are too great to be able to see past that. Hmm. I guess I, I know that healing isn't linear. I guess I'm wondering, I guess there was your state of, of healing and acceptance prior to Jody um, being arrested 
and prior to Jody being um, convicted and sentenced versus having people hear your story and getting all the support, but then also maybe not getting some of the reconciliation or even the justice that you wanted. Yeah. Are you even able to say right now, sort of net net, whether you're overall feeling better about things now than you were before the story broke? Yeah, it's, oh, it's really, it's really complicated. I mean, overall, yes, I feel, I mean, there has been so much, so much joy in my life over the last seven months. There's been so much connection, so much learning to receive comfort, learning to receive support from strangers and community and friends and um, the sense of surrendering into that, that I've never experienced. And I don't think I could have experienced had it not been for this like very um, kind of extreme situation. Um, I have connected with so many people around the world. I, I feel like there's been a catalyst in a lot of ways for like the healing that, um, like healing that I didn't even realize was possible. That was kind of this undercurrent after, after everything kind of came out, after Jody was arrested, there was like kind of this moment that kind of created this uh, subconscious healing um, on top of the very intentional work that I've been doing um, over the last several months. So yes, it's a net positive for sure. Um, that being said, it's like, I, I don't know if you've heard the phrase type two fun, but it's the type of fun where maybe in the moment it's not super fun, but then after the fact, it's like going on a long hike or getting tattooed or things that like may be really hard and difficult in the moment, but you're so grateful for them afterwards. It feels like it's been a lot of that. Mm. Um, which I'm, I mean, I'm, I obviously love type two fun, so <laughs> it's good. <laughs> um, what, what has been, uh, well, let me ask you this. I don't, we weren't able, um, we haven't spoken to you since Jody first pled guilty, yeah. which was, which was at least a month or two before the sentencing, um, I believe. It was December 27th. That was, that's when Jody um, pled guilty. Yeah. Can you tell us what you felt about Jody pleading guilty versus this going to trial? I know you've spoke about, I think, Jody's statement at, at her sentencing. What did you think about Jody's statement about why she decided to plead guilty? And would you have rather seen this go to trial? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know if I can say how I feel about that statement on air, um, but it's, I think it's complete trash. Hmm. I think that you, you can swear. You're okay. allowed to swear. I think it's fucking bullshit. Okay. 100%. Like, which part? She, which part? Like, all her statement about why she pled guilty of like how she just doesn't want to put those kids through more trauma and that she, just cares about the kids and that's why she's doing this and she's taking accountability and like, no, that is it. the only reason I believe that she took the plea deal is that because it was so obviously in her self-interest to do so. I think, I mean, this is just speculation. I mean, I, I, it, I think it's pretty, I, I think I have reason to believe this, but um, I think they had so much more on her. I think if they had, would have gone to trial, she would have gone down in a blaze of glory. Hmm. Um, I think that there was financial incentive for her not to like for her to plead guilty. I think there was incentive all over the place for her to plead guilty, and the evidence was so stacked against her that like if this went to trial, she would have lost. And not only she would she have lost, but I think she would have lost in a very fantastical way. Um, so for her. I think the, the 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 statement that she made about her caring about those children was 100% just a redirection for this new, you know, because now she's just focusing on becoming as likable as possible so she can manipulate the parole board 
into getting the shortest sentencing as possible. Mm. That is 100% what I believe. I don't, she doesn't care about those children. She was torturing them, not m a couple months ago. You don't do that and then turn around and say, oh, I just care about the reason I'm doing this is because I care about, no, that's not what happens. That's not, that's not how it works. Jody is a psychopath. And even the way that she, like during her sentencing, when she's apologize, apologizing, I mean, it was a joke. She, it, it was so, it, it was, she's, it was just, it was horrifying and, 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 and sickening. Like listening to her say things like, I'm sorry that these children didn't take well to our methods or paraphrasing. Like that is the most gaslighting narcissistic form of an apology that I've ever heard. Mm. And that was another moment when I had family members reach out and, and they were so confused by the statement, by the way that she handled it. They're like, we don't understand why, like, she says she's sorry, but she's acting like this. And it's like, we need to stop like ascribing a set of morals that a, you know, a, a healthy human would have onto her because she's not going to act that way. She's acting in the way that a narcissistic psychopath would act. And so when you, when you look at her through that lens, it's no longer confusing. It's like, it actually makes perfect sense. She's not sorry. She's sorry. She got caught. Because I, and I, there's been some, I've learned some information that I, I'm not at a lot allowed to speak about as of yet, but um, there's a lot more stuff about to come out about this. And I'm just so grateful that she got caught. Mm -hmm. I wish it would have been 14 years ago and that these kids would never have had to go through this. And I am so grateful that she got caught before more children were severely abused hmm. what what do you want to share and and this is this may be i don't know flooding for you um or for others so let's be as as careful or thoughtful as we can both for your well-being and others that's yeah. at, at a couple points in this process more details emerged so early on there was the cayenne pepper and the honey related to the wounds of the child that came out. But over time, it, it's been like handcuffing, like like lacerations, the hog tying, the making them work outside in the scorching cement without shoes, like pretty graphic details about the, the torture and the treatment. Is there anything you want to say about what you learned or how that was experienced by you um, when you when you learned it or what observations you have about just the details that have come out maybe since we last talked yeah I mean some of the a lot of the details I didn't know until a little bit further on um, and some of them I didn't know until I was like going on air to talk about it and then they did like an intro and said some of the details and I mean it is it is just sickening it is it's, I mean, it's torture. She was torturing these children. And then the thing that more so than the physical torture, the psychological and spiritual torturing that I know, that I know was happening just like at the same level. Like the fact that these kids were more concerned about her when they, when the police came, they were, they were afraid of, they were like curious, like they were so concerned for Jody's safety they believed that they deserved it. I mean, the level of brainwashing and mind control that's taking place to, to have a child believe that is just horrifying. And that this little boy was convinced he was going to jail, like he was willing to risk jail in his mind than stay at Jody's. And, and it's, it, it's, <clears throat> It is so horrifying that this little that these little kids had to find the strength within themselves to protect themselves, that they were forced to grow up that fast, that they were forced to be that strong. 
no child should have to feel that should have to know what that feels like. And now all of the undoing and unlearning and relearning and reconditioning that has to take place for those kids to to ever have some abnormalcy in their life. To to I mean, and I I was a <clears throat> I was 16 when I went through this and the level of destruction that happened in my life was there, there's no way of qualify quantifying it at all. So to have a, a nine year old now 10 year old and a 12 year old go through this and, and to more and a higher degree than I went through it. I, and to have their mother side by side, like my mom was not there. She knew about some of it, I think. I don't I don't know the le like the level of clarity my mom had on what was going on. Um but she also has the alibi of not being there physically. But to hear the things that these children were put through and the thing that is so enraging is that this could have been stopped 14 years ago. If people would have listened, the people that saw and did nothing, they are, in my mind, partly responsible for this. And I know it's more complicated than that. I know I understand the level of disempowerment and fear and and control that the church has over these people. I understand that. And they were adults that saw this abuse happening and did nothing. And because of that, and then when I tried to go to the cops, the cops did nothing. And when I tried to bring it forward in 2012, my family shut that down. Like there were many, many opportunities for this to be stopped. And no one did anything. And the result of that is now these children have to live with this trauma for the rest of their lives. And it is just, it is so enraging. Hmm. Um, I'll ask you about your, thank you for that. And I totally agree. I think we, especially within Mormon culture, I don't probably other religious traditions too. There's just this bizarre practice of silencing and punishing victims and protecting and empowering and even protecting promoting and empowering the abusers. Yeah. It's, this Mormonism breeds and empowers narcissists. It is, it is such a narcissistic religion. It's, they thrive in this environment because they know that that their their victims will be silenced. They know that no one can touch them. They're told they're special. They're told like it's just it's just it's the amount of shame and like you are special. That combo that exists within the Mormon community and the Mormon culture is just off the charts, and that is a breeding ground for narcissism. Yeah. <clears throat> it's so weird. Um, Jesse, I'm I want to hear your reaction to uh to Ruby Frankie's statement at her sentencing, but before that, there were lots and lots of people trying to make sense. You know, let's just say there I know that nothing's ever a binary, but one scenario is Jody is is a cult leader. Jody created a cult and Ruby is as much a victim of a cult within a cult. So Jody Hildebrandt's connection cult within Mormonism, that's sort of some call that a cult within a cult. And then Ruby's a victim, just like anyone else was a victim of Jody. And there've been many or people who've been victims of the Mormon church or other, other cults. So there's one framing of Ruby as a victim. And then there's another framing, let's just say on another spectrum, the other pole of the spectrum where Ruby is complicit or even more responsible because she's the mom. Uh, I it, it, It's probably hard for you to come down on that, but I'd love to hear any thoughts or comments you have on that. 
Well, I think this is a perfect example of what is one of the, the most dangerous ways of thinking from religion. This idea that there is a singular truth and a singular truth only is, I think, what causes this confusion. I think there's truth to both of those statements. I think that first and foremost, she is their mother and she's an adult and she's responsible for them 100%. I also do think that Jody is a cult leader. And I also do think that Jody is very good at brainwashing and very dangerous when it comes to that type of behavior. So it's, it's complicated because it's hard to hold both things as true at the same time. But I think it's really important that we do so. Ruby is their mother and responsible and she has to be held accountable. Absolutely. But the level of, of evil in the most secular way possible um, that Jody has, that she elicits and expels and creates in her life and in lives of everyone else, I don't think holds a candle. Like, I, I think that's very different than what we're dealing with with Ruby. I think Ruby probably was very primed in her, like she was already pretty controversial in the way that she disciplined her kids. Um, and I think that there was probably, um, I don't know, there, this idea of like, you are special. I think Jody probably played into that with her. Um, but I absolutely believe that Jody manipulated the shit out of Ruby and and her husband and so many other people like the I think the thing that about with Ruby is that Ruby had a platform and I think that's why Jody jumped on it Ruby had a platform and she was she was um, vulnerable to this type of attack and and so Jody took advantage of it that being said, she's still she's still one hundred percent responsible for what the, she did to those children. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. What what did you think about Ruby's? Because the, I I mean the going to to Jody's statement at the sentencing hearing versus Ruby's. Jody's was chilling because there was literally zero apology, and like you said, just this chilling yeah. expression of uh this this chilling expression of concern for the kids and a and a you know good wishes for their welfare which just felt chilling and awful and gross and terrifying weird to me no she's a complete psychopath it's yeah. it is terrifying and this that is why right there is why it's so in like it's so viscerally enraging and terrifying to know that her future is determined now by parole by a parole board that will continuously she'll have continuous like opportunity to plea her case plead her case and that puts the onus of responsibility onto the victims to continuously have to relive their trauma to make sure that she is kept in where she belongs away from anyone and everyone that's vulnerable. And I, 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 I so hope that the state of Utah changes its laws, that laws are, that, that whoever needs to be, whatever needs to happen to, to change child abuse from a, a second degree into a first degree, whatever needs to happen to make that happen, I, I, I so hope it does. Mm, yeah. Because Every time they get to go to like to they get to have a parole hearing, those children, myself, all the other victims, but mainly those children, will have to live in fear. Maybe they'll get out. Maybe she'll get out. And Jody, the masterful manipulator that she is, that's her favorite phrase that she just threw out all the time. Um, who knows what what if she is gets what if she gets to talk to like whoever's on the parole hearing or the parole board, what if they don't understand what they're dealing with? What if, they, what if they don't understand how dangerous and terrifying of the person this is? And that she gets out in four years? In four years? In Idaho, you know, it's it's 99, 99 years in prison for an abortion 
or for aiding someone having an abortion. Yet, like you call yourself pro-life, that gets you 99 years in prison, but to viciously torture children that are alive and viable, four years in prison? Are you fucking kidding me? I mean, it's just this, I, this, this is something is so wrong. This idea, like, especially within the community, you know, the Utah conservative religious community of like, they claiming they're pro-life. And yet this is the, these are the, this is the legislation that's, uh, that, that exists. Make that make sense. Hmm. So um, I guess, I guess, and I don't, I don't know much about about the law is what you're saying, Jesse, that if, that if child abuse or child torture, whatever it is, was made a first degree felony, then they would have the option of either, uh, you know, no parole life, life without parole, or even death penalty. It, that That's what would happen if, if they changed the law. Just so that's, I understand. That's from how I understand it with how it's been explained to me. Yes. That's what yeah, would happen. Okay. So, so right now under Utah law, Jesse could never get a life sentence. I'm oh, sorry, yeah. Jody. Jody could Jody never, would never get a life sentence under the current yeah, legislation. Thank you. No, I'm just trying to understand that. Um, what, what do you think, what did you think and do you think about Ruby Frankie's apology? It was sort of the opposite. She, she not only apologized directly to Kevin, her husband, she apologized to her kids. She was crying. She was emotional. She apologized to her bishop, to her stake. She thanked her bishop. She thanked her stake president. She apologized to the judge, the jury. She thanked the attorneys, the law enforcement. Like it was almost like every possible buffet option in an apology. Uh, I, I tend to just take people at their word. I think I'm maybe a little bit gullible even sometimes. If somebody says something, I tend to just accept it and believe it. There were lots of other people that are like, Ruby isn't sorry. Uh, you know, wh what What were your reactions to Ruby's um, statement at, at the hearing, at the sentencing hearing? I mean, it's hard to know, you know, what's going on in someone's head and in someone's heart. Um, I am more prone to believe her um, I think that she, I think that she is, I think she's having a very real emotional reaction. I think she's having a very real emotional response. Um, I think that being away from Jody, um, is probably having a very visceral response. Like she's probably having a very real, um, kind of withdrawal effect is my guess. Um, and in a, in a similar way of like going off of drugs, it takes time. And then suddenly you're clear headed and you're like, Oh my God, how did I, how did I even get here? What did I do? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's some version of that, that she is going through. And I think that she is a feeling person. I think that I don't think she's a psychopath like Jody. Um, to the extent in which she is sorry, I don't know, because she was also engaging in, in pretty questionable behaviors before her connection with Jody. And, and she was okay with pain as punishment and, you know, her kids going without lunches because they forgot to pack their lunches or so it's, I don't, I don't really, I have a hard time, um, completely villainizing her because of my experiences with Jody. And I know how powerful Jody is and I know how convincing she is and even to adults and adults are human too. So I still think that she needs to take accountability in the full extent of the law. Um, I think that if she was really sorry, that um, that's what she would do. I think if you are truly um, remorseful, you would serve your time, especially for something like that. And if and if and if she tries to play some sort of get out of jail free card because she's sorry, I, I, that's for me, that would be a red flag. 
you know. Would it, do you think it'd be okay for Jody to receive a more severe sentence than Ruby, especially given the disparity in statements or should the statements even matter because statements can be made up or manufactured or faked? Do you have thoughts on that? I, I mean, obviously I, it's just my experience with Jody. I don't know Ruby. I've never, I had never heard of Ruby until this mm -hmm. all came out. Yeah. Um, but given my experience, and the things that I've read, the things I've seen on YouTube, the things that I've just witnessed. Um, I try, I'm, I'm really trying to approach this from a place of accountability versus punishment. I don't, our system of, of um, our judicial, judicial system and, and, and our uh, prison systems are so fixated and obsessed with punishment. And I think that just breeds more of the same. I think it just breeds cr crime and it breeds shame. And it, I, I don't think it's actually effective. Accountability, on the other hand, you know, I think that is actually how um, re like <clears throat> uh, reformation happens. I don't think Jody, I think Jody is way past that. And so in that sense, like, I think there may be hope for Ruby, it, that's what it feels. It feels that way. And just from what I see, that's the conclusion that I, that I seems logical that there's still humanity left in her and that she can, she could um, have, like there could be restorative justice with her. Jody, I don't think that's possible. I think Jody is a, a, a violent and dangerous person that will never change. And I think given any opportunity to take advantage of anyone, she would. And I think that she has proven herself time and time again, that she is a danger to society. And so I absolutely think that her, um, the, the, the appropriate reaction to who she is and what she has done would be considered more harsh because I think there needs to be more, I think there needs to be uh, more safety precautions in place. I think if Ruby got out in, uh, in who knows how many, you know, however long the, the parole board sees fit, however, these children, I think the children should have a massive say in that. Um, to me, that doesn't scare me. The idea of Jody getting out terrifies me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was stunned to see that Jody's house was selling for like five million dollars in Ivan's Utah, and if just her house was worth five million, oh, how much money did she have in the bank and in other investments? Right? Oh, I mean, Jody, Jody had, Jody had a lot of money when I was living with her. Jody's home; she had a three-story home in in uh, in American Fork, Utah like what two streets down from the temple. I mean, and she had, you know, a convertible sports car, like a, a and a motorcycle and a, and a boat and ski jets and, and a, uh, a, what are they called? Uh, what are they called? An RV. Like she, she's been doing very well for a very long time. So knowing how much wealth she had acquired by the time I was 16, I can only imagine. And that's, to me, that's like a major reason why I think that she took a plea deal. I think there was a lot of financial, um, that she would have lost a lot. Yeah. Had it gone to trial. But also just if, if Jody were let out, the things she could do with that money, in, in exactly. theory, there's things she could do with the money while still in prison. Well, That's what I'm, that's exactly what I mean is yeah. that, it's in her best interest to maintain as much wealth as she can. Yeah. Because the, the, she could get out in four years. Yeah. And then in those four years, she's just what stewing and pissed yeah. and forming a vindictive plan of attack <laughs> yeah. because that's the type of person she is. Yeah. That's hor That I mean, I still have nightmares of this woman to this day, mm. multiple times a week. 
Hmm. I, if she were to be, I, I would leave the country. I would leave the country if she were, if she were released. Yeah. Oh, wow. You'd leave the country. I mean, she is. Look at what she was doing to children that did nothing to her. Hmm. That have done nothing to her, but be children. If she's willing to do that to someone that had no power. Hmm. What would she be willing to do to anyone that put her in, well, she put herself in prison, but made sure that she was put away? Mm. Mm. Including those children. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it makes me so sad to know that anyone would potentially be punished for contributing to that justice being served, but that's exactly what could happen. I mean, best case is just that Jody would be legally vindictive and sue people for defamation or shut people down, cease and desist letters, but it could get, it could get much worse. I mean, the imagination could I mean, be to really dark places. I, I, when, when she, when I first decided to go public, I remember I was, I was talking to her daughter and I had this moment of just complete and utter terror come over me. Like truly I've, I'm never, I like, I, I can't, rem I don't know if I've actually ever experienced this before of like, I mean, I know this is very dark, but this, this, fe this feeling of like, am I physically safe? right now like would she like could she kill me and I, I remember talking to her daughter and just being like am I am I crazy is this like do you think do you do you think have you thought this like you know I was trying to like gauge my own sanity um against hers but yeah that's I mean She's terrifying. Hmm. So are you in touch with, with Jody's children? Jody has two daughters. Is that right? Uh, she's a daughter and a son. Okay. Daughter. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm in touch with her daughter um, off and on. Uh, it's kind of a complicated relationship. Uh, I mean, it's not complicated in, in the sense of like the active relationship, but I think that we both, um, I mean, she was there when I was going through what I went through with Jody, And so there's not that many people that understand hmm. what Jody is and can do and how she embeds in you like a parasite. And I, I think I may have said this last time, but something that she said to me, um, Jody's daughter, um, something to the effect of I I can't be around my mom because if she told me the sky was yellow I'd believe her and that is still like the most succinct way of explaining how powerful Jody is because mm. I felt the exact same way everything that she told me everything that she did I thought I deserved I thought I I was evil. I thought I was these things that she said I was. I'm hearing those little kids talk about how they thought that they deserved it was just so, like, I know what that feels like. I know what that sounds like. To have that voice just echoing in your head that you deserve these horrific things. Because of, I mean, Jody could make you feel like you deserved it for anything, for anything that you did. Oh, you didn't clean that well enough. Oh, you took one minute longer in the shower. Oh, that's because you don't give, you don't care about people's money and you are just using people and you're entitled. You're entitled. You think that you can just use people's water. 
like she could she had this uh, she has this ability to find anything to use against you and she'll find the jugular it's like she has like a radar detector it's yeah it's uh it's something else mm. thank you for sharing um I'm pretty sure I interviewed Adam Paul Steed after I interviewed you. Yeah. And uh, that video meant a lot to a lot of people until we were forced to take it down, which I was super bummed about. I know that Adam attended uh, Jody's sentencing and Adam has been muzzled at times. And then lately, especially at the sentencing and after he's, He's uh, opened his voice again. Yeah. But I guess I have a couple questions. Did you get a chance to see Adam Paul Steed's interview before it was taken down? I saw clips of it. I don't I don't know if I saw the whole thing, but I, I definitely saw clips of it. Do, and do you have a sense for the way that Jody dealt with married couples and specifically the way that she divided husbands from women, isolated the men? got everyone to accuse the men as, as being child abusers when when most of the time they weren't and then basically just wrecked marriages and wrecked so many men's lives are you familiar with oh yeah that aspect of what jody did oh yeah i am um, i'm very familiar with that and i mean it's she has this way of triangulating someone has to be the bad guy there's always it's like the it's like textbook. Like there's the 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 perpetrator, the victim, and then the savior. She's the savior, and so she she finds the perpetrator. It's usually the husband. He's the narcissist. Everyone's a narcissist. She, I remember like hearing her talk about her clients, and every man she saw was a narcissist, according to her. And that she was on the, she would say things like, oh, I'm on the front lines fighting Satan in the flesh with these narcissistic men. And so, yeah. And, and once you paint someone a narcissist, it, it, you're seeing them through that lens. And I'm sure maybe there were narcissists. I mean, I don't know. Like, obviously I'm not a professional, but that was very much the, I mean, that's what she did with me. She was a savior. I was the perpetrator. My parents were the victims like this triangulation was constant in everything. And so like the, the separation of husbands, I actually, um, I spoke to, um, I think I can say this. I spoke to, um, to uh, Kevin. Oh, Oh, so you, you spoke to Ruby's husband, Kevin Frankie, or I, I, I was emailing. Yeah. I emailed with him hmm. a couple of times. And I mean, that was the exact, the exact formula that he presented that happened to him. These men's groups, these, the separation, the triangulation, the, 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 just the complete and utter destruction of sense of self and self-worth and understanding of how you fit into your family, like the, the family dynamic and into the, like you, you are this internalized and complete but like this belief of complete, uh, what's the word? Um, that everything about you is is bad. There's not one part of you that's good, and that and it, usually I'm sure I, I, it seems to be that's usually the the husband in these scenarios. The woman, the the wife is the victim, and Jody's the savior. Yeah. Um, you, you talked a, a bit of, you alluded to some of the, what I'm about to ask in, in our last interview, people are still trying to make sense of the nature of Jody and Ruby's relationship. And even, even the major networks are trying to figure out if there was something more than just a business relationship or a close friendship. Of course, we're LGBTQ affirming on Mormon stories and we believe people's private lives are their private lives. But but there 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 seems to be just sort of ceaseless questions, I guess around wondering whether there was a romantic relationship yeah. between Jody and and Ruby, and if you if you have nothing to say about that, that's great too. I was just curious if you thought about that and if there's anything you thought you might want to share about that. Um, I mean, I have no idea what their relationship was like. 
I know there's I know there's a lot of speculation about about Jody, and there's been speculation I think her whole life. Um, I can confirm nor deny what I know about uh, about her um, orientation. Um, I know that queerness was a an obsession of hers people's sexual orientation, this obsession of being queer as being evil and, and being like a, a perversion. Um, yet making statements, I think I said last time she made this statement about how her and her friend <laughs> it was so wild. She just like told, I mean, I don't know if she told on her, I, I don't know, but she said this thing where she was basically saying that if her and her friends had sexual connection, it wouldn't be wrong because they loved each other. But if gay people did, it would be bad because that's perverted. And mm. I, re I remember just being like, what? <laughs> like, that's just, that's what, that's just being gay. Like, yeah, gay couples love each other. That's why they are together. Like, that's, so, I mean, I know there's a lot of speculation and I, I don't, I really don't know about Ruby and her specifically. I do. And I do know that she tends to have really messy, complicated relationships with, with like women. She has like a, um, what do they call it? Like with borderline personality disorder, it's like this, um, like almost like a hyperfixation friend. I don't remember. There's like a name for yeah, it. Yeah. 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 Um, and I know that she's been diagnosed with, from what I've been told, she's been diagnosed with, with that as well. Um, so I think she has like these really intense, hyper fixated, enmeshed relationships with women. Um, whether those bleed into romance, I don't know. Um, but I do know that they are very messy. Yeah. Um, I guess I get going to going to Jody's sentencing. If, she is sentenced with the max, which is 30 years. That's pretty much life in yeah. prison. I'm I imagine you'd be feel more guilty about 30 than four. Um I, I I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on that, but also there's gotta be other victims. There's gotta be other people um interested in suing Jody besides Adam Paul Steed or or you know the state or Ruby. Yeah. There's got to be opportunities for civil lawsuits. And then there's got to be a lot of other victims that because now they don't have to fear Jody as much, or they feel like now they're safe to potentially yeah. sue her because she's more limited in what she can do. Yeah. Are you are you aware of other lawsuits? Are you interested? Are you even able to talk about whether you're interested in? And do you have hope for other lawsuits kind of finishing the job that maybe the Utah parole board won't finish. Um, I, I don't know of any active lawsuits, um, any other active lawsuits. Um, I mean, I would love to take her down for everything that she is worth. Um, if only to just like pay for therapy <laughs> and, school and all the things that I lost out on life because of her. Um, that being said, I don't, I don't know if I could emotionally handle what it would take to act, to, to bring a case against her. I don't know if like the, 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 the cost versus reward would be, um, not that it wouldn't be worth it, but I don't know if I could handle it. Mm. Um, if I were to pursue it, I would, I would need help. I would, I would need, I would need help to do that. Um, I, I hope that any victim of hers, whether they came forward or not, um, cause I'm certain, I mean, I know that there are more, I've had stories, people telling me, um, that they were DMS and emails of, of my parents, went to her and then destroyed her marriage. I was forced to see her as a teenager. I like, I've heard many stories of people that were very affected by her to the, like, you know, to different degrees um, and not a single positive one. I have not heard a single positive being like anyone coming to the defense of her. Like I've heard, and it was before. Okay. So before, 
I don't know if this was before Connections Classroom or not, or but before it was before it like really kind of blew up. I remember if you typed in Jody's name, it would come up on it would come up like her um, therapy would come up on Google reviews, and it had like two and a half stars. And at some point in the last few years, she had that removed from Google, so you can when you typed in her name, Connections Classrooms came up instead, and that was like this like filtered you know, veil that protected her. Um, but I remember like, yeah, like on her Google reviews were horrific. And, and she was able to like expunge that from the internet, unfortunately. So like, I know that there are a lot of people that have been affected by her. And I hope if there, if there's like a collective lawsuit that is like, ends up forming. Like a class action. Like yeah. If there's like a class action lawsuit. I will sign me up and yeah. I'm sure many people would be willing to sign like sign their names off of that. Yeah. That that's a good idea. You were, um, you were really uh, great in talking about how uh, Jody inappropriately had you work for her as both a client and a, a, kind of almost indentured servitude yeah. and how you were able to witness that much of many of the bills that Jody was sending out were to the Mormon church Oh yeah, because the Mormon church was both recommending people to Jody through bishops and elsewhere, but also funding a lot of this quote treatment or therapy. Um, we, we talked a little bit about this before. I want to give you another chance. If you've had any reflections, we've talked about Jody's culpability, Ruby's culpability. Where are you landing these days on the Mormon church's culpability and all this, both in terms of its doctrine, its theology, and specifically it's enabling and empowerment and it's enriching. Jody wouldn't have five to 10, whatever, five to $10 million in net worth. I'm assuming if, if it weren't for the Mormon church, so I'm curious if you've had reflections on any of that. Oh, absolutely. I think the Mormon church, the culture, I mean, but really, I mean, it's the church, the organization, I think is so responsible for this. Like, I understand that, you know, the everyday Mormon is not going to be like, the people, and, and I, I don't want to use the phrase that like that they themselves use all the time, like people are imperfect and the church is perfect, but like, or the doctrine is perfect. But <clears throat> I, I, I don't hold every Mormon responsible for this, of course. But the people that were in power that were aware of her, that, that fed into her bullshit, that edified her bullshit, that deceived people, by claiming that pornography addiction is a real thing and then and then uh, using the church funds to to heal you know to you know to use the like it's like conversion therapy for pornography is so destructive and is very much empowering women or not just women uh, like people like Jody to have a, a, a voice of influence that she should never have had and the like there's legal issues here too because i know i said this before in the dsm-5 pornography addiction is not a thing it's not real you you cannot according to the dsm-5 which is what insurances use to be built like you know it's all based off of um um what's it called when you're with by on diagnoses um so what they would do is they, they would tell the client hey, you have pornography addiction. Hey, your son, your 14-year-old son, you know, he's a porn addict. Um, you need to go to, to Jody. Don't worry, we'll bill your insurance for depression. But, but we're, gonna, we're going to um, use methods for pornography addiction. So the, there was a lot of deceit going on in that way as well. And it's just, I 100% hold the church responsible. The church... Bishop Bingader, the per my bishop in American Fork, American Fork, I think it was the eighth ward. Is what I remember. Bishop Bingader, he knew exactly what was happening. I had meetings with the bishop with Jody and my grandparents, and he dead ass looked me in the eyes and told me he was trying to break. They were trying to break me like a horse. 
Like they knew what was going on. They've been funding and supporting her this entire time, giving her clients, giving her wealth. And they're just going to try to, and I think maybe that even played a part in the, in the plea deal. Like what, you know, that I don't know if the church wanted this attention. And so I, I, I mean, this is all speculation, but it wouldn't surprise me if the church wanted this to go away as quickly as possible. Because if I think if they opened that door, that can of worms, a lot of skeletons would come out that the church probably doesn't want people to know about. Yeah. 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 If there's a, if, if, if it simply goes to the discovery phase where Jody, Jody Hildebrandt has to provide all the invoices and client lists yep. and uh, techniques and methods and referral sources that implicates the church right there. So the church wants this settled before any evidence uh, implicating the Mormon church can, can be yeah. revealed. And I, I fully stand by that. I think that yeah. there's so much truth to that. Let me just also just ask you this. In addition to the Mormon church supporting Jody, referring people to Jody and giving Jody so much money of apparently there's just the core doctrine that um, extramarital sex, sex before marriage, sex outside of marriage, and any same-sex sexual activity, those are all sins next to murder, which yeah. doesn't just, you know, touch on pornography addiction and masturbation, but it's also what allowed you and others to be, you know, kidnapped and sent to troubled teen centers in Utah yeah. or put, um, you know, under the care of Jody, which then led to the abuse. And it's not just you, obviously, it's not just Jody's victims, but there's an entire trouble teen industry oh, yeah. fueled at its core. You know, there's, there's drug use that concerns parents, but many people, you know, we had someone on Mormon stories recently, all they did was they had sex. This is a woman who had sex with her boyfriend at age 17 and her parents basically kidnapped her and sent her for months to a troubled teen center. Oh, my but it's, God. But it's rooted in this Mormon teaching that's in the Book of Mormon that sex next to murder. Yeah. marriage is next to murder. Which, okay, like, I'm not, like, I don't, I'm not trying to, like, argue doctrine because I don't think it's true. I think it's all bullshit. But also, like, when they were talking about sex outside of marriage, they were talking about affairs. They're not talking about premarital sex. Like, that's... First of all, like that alone is like is so frustrating. Um, but outside of that, like the shame that and the, I was I was talking about that this about this this morning actually. When you internalize this belief that sex is second to murder, coffee and beer and heroin are the same. Um, showing your shoulders and having cleavage will get you raped, and it's your fault. And it's actually your responsibility to make sure that men don't think bad things about you. When you're internalizing this all like in, the, in this, this narrative about yourself and how you fit into this, it's just, it's a breeding ground for this type of like punishment because you have no barometer for right and wrong. Like your, your, your senses, your sensors are so skewed when you think something like having sex. I mean, one of the, one of my young women's lessons, I remember she had a sucker, had they gave it to the first girl and was like, okay, now pass it down. That's you. That's you if you've had sex. And you're like, I think I was like 13, maybe young, 12. I mean, I was like 12 to 14 years old when this, like with this lesson. And at that time too, it was, I, I must've been, I must've been like 14 because at that time I had a friend who had had sex in that, like, that was a part of our group. And I don't know if they knew, but I knew. And it's like the shame and the guilt that these, these adults are just shoving down these kids' throats for, for no reason, except like this, this, it, I mean, it's control. That's what it is. It's coercive control. And, and going also talking about the, the, the very um, dangerous doctrines <clears throat> that are taught within the church, the, the doctrine of personal revelation, like very literal personal revelation and the structure of patriarchal 
you know, you know, your dad is the patriarch of your family. He received revelation for the family. Those two things are just a recipe for abuse and the, and the rationale to support abuse. And that's what Jody, that's the thing. That's one of the things that Jody like used all the time was this like, Oh, God spoke to me in a dream. And then if you have the doctrine to support that of personal revelation, you know, and, and Moroni like ask and you shall receive or whatever. When that is taken to a literal, you know, definition, it's literal definition and implemented in a very literal way, you can get away with anything. I mean, we've seen this time and time again. I mean, I'm I'm sure sure you've seen Under the Banner of Heaven, uh, Eliza Smart. There's so many like, and those are the extreme ones, but I, like the day to day smaller ones that you can just rationalize anything because of this doctrine. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think also a point I wanted to make is just like we talked about Ruby's responsibility versus Jody's, you know, your parents, as I, yeah, I'm, as I'm trying to remember your story, I'm pretty sure they were terrified that you would have sex or that you would have lesbian sex or whatever. Yeah. And that's why they were willing to do something so extreme yep. as put you in Jody's care, send you to another state to no longer be in their custody or care yeah. because they had been conditioned and terrified by the Mormon church that yeah. if you had sex, you would then be committing a sin next to murder. So that's that's one of the things I've been frustrated with some media outlets. They want to talk about the handcuffs and the honey and the cayenne pepper and the hog tying of the children, but they don't want to talk about you know, they want to talk about the sentencing or Jody, but they don't want to talk about the theology and that the doctrine that's, at the, core, that's yeah. at the root of creating this and now all the other perpetrators that are going to come later. Well, that, that I was, I was, I was just talking, I was just talking to someone earlier today about this. I was leaving the interview I had done and I was talking to the person that I'm, I'm seeing. And I was like, the thing that I'm so frustrated about with like the documentaries, the true crime stories that are about things like this is that they're all individualized. They're all these like very, you know, sensationalized stories that get a lot of attention and it just kind of remains in this cocoon over here, but there's no string that attaches all of them. And it's like, what is foundationally and culturally allowing for these people to rise to power in a very consistent way to take advantage of these children or just vulnerable populations in general? And like, how do we get to that route so we can stop it from happening in the first place? Because until we get to that, this is going to be repeated. It may look different. It may have a different name, but it's going to be repeated. The fact that like Anasazi and all of these programs have been around for so long, all of these, um, was it Compass Point? There was like all the schools in Utah where all of these like celebrity kids and non-celebrity kids are sent to and the amount of abuse, like with Paris Hilton, that came out and, and talked about it. Like this is this has been going on for so long. And because of these stories are just individualized, it's never getting to the root of it. And if we want to get to the root of it, we have to have those uncomfortable conversations about the culture at large, about the culture that disempowers its people and to keep them in control, like the coercive control. They're actually, I wanna grab a book real fast. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just while you're grabbing the book, I'll just say that um, it, what's hard about the Mormon Church, for the, the Mormon Church would have to change the Book of Mormon to change the the doctrine of the passage that sexual sin yeah. is next to murder um, in in evil. And as soon as the Mormon Church changes the Book of Mormon yet again, yeah. does it in such a public and obvious way. Um, it's, it's, you know, people are going to wonder whether Joseph was making the book up, right. Or why would they change it? I mean, it's, it's already happening. That's already like, there's the mass exodus of like, of people leaving the church because of these, like, oh, actually we're going to change this because it's people are kind of like, like even like <laughs> how the first strength of youth pamphlet note, like, I guess like now you can have tattoos and now you can have like second piercings, but like, that was like the most horrible thing you could possibly do to your body. And then overnight, it's just fine. Like, are you kidding me? And, and and people are picking up on this. They're seeing it. I know I've had conversations with people that are still in the church. And they're like, wait, I thought God was 
you know, the same today as it was yesterday as forever. Um, I had a friend um, give me this or like, let me borrow this book. It's. Oh, I yeah. I don't know if you've heard of this. Oh, we, we've had Luna Lindsay Corbin on Mormon Stories. Yeah. I need to listen to her episode because, oh, my God. This is non-binary. They don't pronounce, by the they way. Okay, I, I would have to listen to their, their profile yeah, or yeah. Their, 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 um, their episode. It's it's like it's actually like five episodes. It's so brilliant that we had to do it in like five episodes, but it's really good. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to listen to it. Yeah. This is good. this is just changing. Because yeah. there's, there's the connection because it's all the same. You know, yeah. the connection of like mind control. I mean, I know the word mind control is very very loaded, but like mind control and brainwashing. It's it's when you get to the micro level and the macro, it's all of the same. And that's like that is right there is what Jody is tapping into. And that's what the the culture is just steeped with this. It's yeah. just so primed for this. And Jody saw it and was just like, "Sweet, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is mine for the taking." Yeah, it's like ka-ching. Ka yeah, it's like, oh, I'm gonna. Oh, <laughs> this harvest is wonderful. I'm just gonna have all these apples. Like that's so dark. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's it's also so true. And so like having. And I, I, I still, I think there is hope that there can be at least some shifting in the church because it, the church isn't going away. It's going to be here. And so working within that to make at least some shifts forward, I think is important. Um, what recommendations would you have to, if the more, I'm sure the Mormon church at some level is watching this interview I know I'm putting you on the spot with this question, but do you have any tips or advice to the Mormon church based on the experiences you've had and the life lessons you've learned, not just with Jody, but just having been raised Mormon and, and everything, what, what tips or advice would you give the Mormon church? If you can think of anything on, on the spot. <laughs> sure. I mean, for a culture that is so obsessed with the nuclear family, um, I think that we need to have a rewriting of parenting, like a very deep rewriting of how we parent. Um, and that's that's more than just the Mormon church, too. I think that's like the collective at large. And I think there is a shift happening. Um, people like Dr. Becky Kennedy, um, she is a she's a psychologist focusing on gentle, she like does like gentle parenting and internal family systems. She has a book called Good Inside that I uh, recently read and I want to reread it because it's so good. It's a parenting book, but it's also um, really wonderful to use the tips and the tools for like reparenting in like somatic practices and whatnot. Um, it's been really helpful and healing for me. Um, so like the shift away from this top down authoritarian style parenting, which is just, again, it's like this microcosm of the collective of the, like the, the culture at large and, um, and, and starting more of like this bottom up of loving, just loving your children, supporting your children, listening to your children. I mean, children are the most marginalized groups of people in the world because you have marginalized people. And then you have the children within those marginalized communities. They are the most not like unbelieved pushed to the sidelines. Like they are, they are the most marginalized group of people. And so this, we need a shifting away from that mentality into, into loving, to loving children. We need to believe them. We need to stop thinking that they're just little adults. I think that's something that like so many people struggle with is that they look at a child and they're like, you're just a small little adult when their brain is a quarter formed. And so like teaching children how to self-regulate, how to like, like a coach almost. I think the parenting style of coaching, I think is a really beautiful concept of like teaching skills and teaching children to love themselves with kindness. Um, I've been just kind of obsessed with learning as much as I can about gentle parenting. And the more and more I learn about it, the more I like, I think that is the, that is the way of the future. If we want to change our present, like we need to focus on the next generation and teach them to love themselves and teach them to believe themselves, to stand up for themselves, to trust their experience, to trust their intuition, because 
that I think is a big reason why this, these types of things happen is that you have a group of people that don't trust themselves. They, they abandon their intuition. They abandon themselves, their values, their morals for this authoritarian figure. And in this case, it was Jody, but in another case, it could be someone else. This like, this lack of um, critical thought that is very much, it's like, it's taught, right? Like this is very intentionally, or it's very intentionally not taught to just like turn, like just to trust whoever is in charge. And that, and the, the scary thing, I don't know if you experienced this at all, but I know that for myself, when I left the church, <clears throat> I kind of fell for a lot of bullshit. And I, I kind of like went from one kind, I left the Mormon church and then I went to like straight edge, like very like into like anarcho-punk, straight edge, veganism. But I found, I found I was still very much in the mindset of a singular truth truth of a capital T, I just need to, like, I need to have an authoritarian figure telling me what to do, telling me what to wear, telling me what to listen to. It was like kind of like just a new dogma that replaced the old dogma because I was still, the programming was still the same. And so like I had to teach myself through classes. I had, to, I took classes on critical thought because I, I saw how little, like how I didn't have really any skills in that department. And now the more and more I learn about it, the more I learn about trusting myself, the more I do somatic therapy and somatic work, the more I learn about my intuition, the more I learn about, you know, building trust in myself, the more space I have for other people, the more space I have for other people's experiences, the less I want to control things. Like it's just that I think is the, I think that is the only way forward. Yeah. Yeah. The idea, I love that idea of parenting that one way I've heard it described is parents aren't like carpenters that like cut up wood and make things. They're more like gardeners where they, the seed is what the seed is. And then the seed gets planted and the parent can help nurture <clears throat> and provide the conditions for that seed to grow into whatever it was meant to grow into. But the parent isn't the one deciding what it grows into. Yeah. The seed is growing into what it was always meant to grow into. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And there, I, there's a there's a video on Dr. I, I'm obsessed with Dr. Becky Kennedy. If you don't know who she is, I highly recommend looking her up. She is a joy. I absolutely love her. Um, but she uses this analogy of a coach a lot. And there was one video in particular where she was saying, like, you know, if your child kept missing a, a, a like a, a layup in basketball. You wouldn't go tell that child to go to its room. Like if the coach was like, go to your room, you're bad because you keep missing this layup. Like you'd be like, that's really stupid. Like that doesn't teach the child anything that just teaches them that they're bad. Like you would be, you would be frustrated with that coach. But if you replace the layup with anything else, with any other sort of life skill, that's a very common like go-to practice for parents of, Oh, you having a tantrum? Go to your room. But that doesn't teach a child anything. That doesn't teach them any regulation skills. It teaches them not how to feel their emotion. If anything, what it does is, is it put this is when they this is the beginning of when people start abandoning themselves. They learn, I'm bad. My reaction, my my emotions are bad. I'm going to shove this down. I'm going to ignore what I feel. I'm going to ignore what I think. I'm going to, you know, do whatever I have to do to have mommy and daddy love me. And that just continues into adulthood. And those creates, you know, these, these people that deny who they are, deny themselves, and then have no ability to hold space for other people. Because I think that also is happening. These parents are seeing their children that are acting in such authentic ways when they themselves have no contact or ability to access their own authenticity. And so there's projection, there's jealousy, there's anger and shame that all comes up. And they want to push down their child because they were themselves were never allowed to have authenticity. So I think that's like the generational trauma that's happening on top of, you know, under the umbrella of coercive control that's going on within the church. So it's, we need to get, I mean, healing therapy, <laughs> like good somatic therapy and internal family systems. Those are the two th forms of therapy that I found the most healing and the most helpful um, there's a really great book as well that has been really helpful for me called 
nonviolent communication, I think everyone would benefit from listening or reading that book. Um, it's all about self-witnessing, witnessing other people, empathy, holding space, holding space within ourselves. And, and it, it's all in the framework of account like self accountability, but not in a way that is kind of like gross capitalistic, pull yourself up by the bootstrap kind of way, like in a very genuine um, way that is actually, I think, really healthy. Beautiful. I'm going to almost withdraw the question about what you would tell the church to do. Cause the church is like worth $260 billion at this point. They can, oh, they, have, they don't care about what I say, <laughs> figure it out. They can figure it out on their own, but let's turn now. I know that healing was a really important healing and growth is a really important part of why you wanted to do this episode. Yeah. And if I had to pick maybe another set of questions that were really prevalent, people just want to know, number one, how you're doing and people find uh, Jesse, your, um, affect your communication style, your wisdom, very inspiring. So the types of questions I'm getting in mass about for you, Jesse, are like, how does what? How did Jesse heal? How is how is Jesse doing with emotion regulation, with self care? Yeah. What tips? How how has Jesse healed after so much trauma? And what tips or tricks would Jesse offer for those of us who are trying to heal? From trauma, and I know that's not just uh, you know an entire podcast; it's multiple okay. podcasts. But what 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 would you like to sh share uh, in response to some of those questions? Yeah, I mean, I mean, those are tough. They're very complex and hard to unpack because they're multifaceted and all connected. Um, I mean, first and foremost, I, I'm not healed. That's the, 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 the idea of like that I've arrived at healing is, is not, is not true. Um, I'm triggered. I, I mean, I have complex PTSD from this. Um, I have triggers daily that I, I, I've gotten pretty good at recognizing and I've been fortunate enough to have a really amazing therapist that has helped me build tools to, somatically feel those things and to process. Um, but this is a, this is, I, I know I can't say this for certain, but I, I suspect I will be dealing this with this my whole life. This isn't just something that goes away. And I think, I think, I think people have this idea that healing means an absence of, and I think I've realized that healing is, is that's, it's actually the opposite healing is the presence of the presence of space, the presence of tools, the presence of mind, the presence of um, action plan, because trauma doesn't just go away. You know, um, things that have helped me significantly um, journaling. I'm an avid journaler. Um, if you don't like journaling, even just, getting your phone out and recording yourself just like just a kind of a I, I used to call it a, a soul vomit <laughs> where I would just like I would write and just like get everything out of my mind those types of um, practices help getting into the habit or getting comfortable with asking yourself really uncomfortable questions um, and I, I guess what I mean by that is like what is considered shadow work um, getting to know those parts of us that we have rejected, um, getting to know those parts of us that we feel the most shame around. And it's very difficult. This is not, none of this is easy work, but I promise you it is worth it. Um, if you, if you can, and if you do have access to resources like therapy, I know it's really difficult. I know it's really expensive. I know that it's kind of a crapshoot if you get a good one. But if you can get a good one, if you can have, if you do have access to it, that is, especially if they, if they are trauma, I mean, hopefully they're all trauma informed, but trauma informed therapy, um, specifically with somatic therapy. And like I said, internal family systems, which like parts work, um, has been so, so crucial to 
where I am today. And the practice of, um, of self-witnessing. So something that I realized <clears throat> when I, so I cut, okay, sorry, I'm cutting. Let me no, recenter myself. I um, a really big question. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of different angles to answer it from. So this is great. Thank you. Of course. Um, so when I, when I cut my parents off about two years ago, um, what I realized what was happening was I was so, I, I realized that I was set in this mindset of if they don't acknowledge it, I will never move on. They need to acknowledge it. They need to, like, they need to apologize. They need to validate me. Otherwise I'm stuck. And I realized how disempowering that was. I realized how like that will probably never happen. And getting to that point of letting that be okay was, I mean, it, it, it took a decade. Um, but once I reached that point and realized that they will never, they probably will never give me what I want. And in reality, what I do want is I need to start validating that. I need to start witnessing that. I need to start telling myself that these things happened and that my pain is real and my pain is valid and starting these practices of, of self validation and self witnessing. And like, I remember the first time I like, so like the practice, there's a lot of like closing your eyes and breathing and like putting your hands on your, your on your body, on your chest, just like a connective grounding practice. And I remember the first time I just told myself, I see you. I see how much pain you're in. I see, I see how, how angry you are. I see. And I just started saying things like that. And I remember the first time I did that, just this complete breakdown that happened. And it was like, I had the little me, the, the parts of me that were, you know, that were abandoned, the parts of me that were abused were just desperate for this. And they have been screaming for this. And the moment I started doing this work of, of a lot, some people call it like reparenting. Some people call it like inner child work. Um, the moment I started doing this is when things started changing for me. And uh, I mean, anyone that's listening that is interested in these, just a quick Google search, inner child work, shadow work, uh, internal family systems, that will get you at least in the direction. There are many journal prompts um, that you can start. That asking you can start asking these questions. It's a lot of self work, the healing parts. And actually, though, kind of a, a different avenue of healing, though, that I've experienced in the last seven months is is the healing work that happens within community and learning how to receive and learning how to be vulnerable with those around you and letting people show up for you. Cause I think a pretty common experience that I've, I've heard from other people that have gone through immense amount of trauma is this hyper um, independence. Um, this like avoidance of relying on anyone ever. Um, and I know that I, I very much fell into that category of never wanting to be vulnerable with anyone ever mm, yeah, and, and realizing that it was safe, like, because I did these years of self-witnessing and finally being able to feel like I can open up to people that I, I love and that love me. Um, the amount of healing that happens within those spaces is just, it, it's indescribable. Like when you can just feel held by by your community, by your, by people that you love and cherish and you can be your most torn apart self and that they'll just hold the pieces together has been just magic. Um, all this being said, it's, I mean, not, like you, like you had mentioned, healing is not linear and it's messy and it doesn't stop. I think that's another thing at myself I have to remind myself of. I'm very much like a type A 
achievement oriented type of person. And I'm like, okay, well, if I do all of the journal prompts and I do the ice baths and I am vegan and I run five miles and I do the breathing exercises, then I'll be fixed. And I think that's like actually a form of trauma that has come out of the perfectionistic aspects of Mormonism, the check boxes. Mm. Um, so yeah, healing is painful. Healing is messy. Healing is not linear. It's not a one size fits all. But if I can offer any sort of guidance in terms of like directions to, to head into, um, like I said, I just, inner child work, internal family systems, self-witnessing, journaling, um, somatic work, feeling emotions. Like the, I don't know if you've heard this or not, but I remember what the first time I heard it was news to me. Like an emotion actually only lasts, I think about 90 seconds in the body, like physically. And our resistance to feeling emotion is what keeps it going. And as I got better and better at recognizing when I had an emotion like, and being able to be like, wow, I'm sad. And then just sitting in that, wow, I'm angry. Wow. I'm, you know, insert emotion, which is, goes back to the book I had mentioned earlier. Nonviolent communication is so good at this. It talks about like the difference between interpretation and, and emotion. So often we, we say things like, I feel, I feel like you're not listening but that's not a feeling, that's an interpretation. And so the, the closer we can get to what we're actually feeling and then validating that feeling, I think the closer we can get to healing. Mm, beautiful. Yeah, and I don't wanna like scare people off, but I've also like, I've had, I've had more bad therapists than good. Yeah. But there are good therapists out there. They really, and I have found people that are focused on things like somatic work, um, which is a trauma informed type of therapy and internal family systems. I, I, f I really feel and believe um, that if, if those are their modalities that they're working in, um, they're probably going to be safer for people that have complex PTSD versus someone that does like CBT or mm -hmm. any sort of like just uh, speak therapy. Um, Cause trauma is so you can talk about trauma all day long, but if, it, if you're not, if you're not, if you're not letting yourself feel it and process it, yeah, it's, you're going to find a plateau. You're going to find, at least I, that's how I, that's something that I found. I, I reached this point where I was like, I can't, I've intellectualized this to the upteenth degree. I, I understand this in and out cognitively. And yet I feel so stuck. And it wasn't until I started learning about sensation and and how uncomfortable I, I i learned that i was actually dissociating all of the time out like using like hyper like like hyper intellectualizing emotions as a form of um self-soothing so i wouldn't have to feel these emotions and unfortunately the only way out of it is through yeah so annoying <laughs> Yeah, and I'm getting a lot of people in the comments saying, wait, there's really good life coaches out there, which is true. Uh, my wife, Margie's a life coach. And there's also people saying master's level therapists can also be fantastic, which is also true. Um, I'll note that Jody Hildebrandt was a master's level. I don't even think Jody Hildebrandt was a therapist uh, now that I have looked at her credentials. I think it was like Ed Psych or Child. She was, from what I, from what I understand, she was a, um, a family, family lesson, a family, oh, what are they called? She, I, she was a therapist. She, yeah. had, she, had, she had a master's. Um, but I, weirdly, I don't think her master's was in like therapy. Hmm. But maybe she took the exam to get her therapy license, but last I looked, but it, I'm, I'm getting us off track. I apologize. You just, there are, scientific yeah. empirically supported methods for treating therapy make sure that whoever you find use evidence-based yes. approaches to treating trauma uh 
and the more experience they have, the more expertise, the more training, the more that they've trained under an expert in evidence-based treatments for trauma, yes. likely the better treatment you're going to get. And yes, that can be a coach or a master's level therapist, but just please think of it as an expertise, not as something that someone does just because they throw the word up on their website and tell you they've they've treated a lot of people with trauma. And I know, and I know that if you have, if you've been through a significant amount of trauma, one of the things that I'm sure you're dealing with is not being able to trust yourself and trust your intuition. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're seeking out a therapist and something doesn't feel right, trust it. Because that, that if something is coming up in a way that feels constrictive or wrong, it probably is. Yeah. Um, I promise you I wouldn't keep you more than two hours, so I'm going to try and jam a few more questions into the, our time remaining. I will ask everyone really quickly. I don't do sponsorships. I don't do paid ads uh, other than what YouTube throws up. If people just subscribe to this YouTube channel, like this, comment on it, share it, and then we thank our donors that make Mormon Stories possible. If you want to see content like this, please go to mormonstories.org, become a monthly donor. That's how we pay for all this. That's all I'll say. Really quickly, uh, Jesse, um, do you want to talk really quickly? I want to talk about your plans for the future at the end. Uh, do you want it all to talk about the media coverage, the news coverage, any of the documentaries, or are you? is that something you're not even allowed to or want to talk about? Is there anything you want to talk about that, or even like what it's like to be part of a global news story? That, that's fine too. I mean, the the <laughs> it's been very ineffable, honestly. Um, the nature in which this trauma happened was so was so isolating. Um, the nature in which, like the types of trauma, the type of trauma that I experienced with Jody was so isolating not being believed was so isolating, not being validated was so isolating. And now, because I didn't know anyone that had gone through something like this, and now the the conclusion of this has also been very isolating. It's like, it's just so bizarre. Like, I've, I don't know anyone that has gone through this type of experience of having their most vulnerable, or not, most personal stories. And I, I understand that I chose to go public. I totally understand that. Um, but to have it be just out there is just so surreal. I have, I've had, <laughs> I had someone recognize me at the grocery store a little while ago. I've uh -huh. had people recognize me outside of like, well, actually one of my favorite musicians, this was so crazy on new year's, I had I went to Chicago for a show and one of my because one of my favorite musicians was playing and we were we were like all outside the venue afterwards and she was standing there and she was like, why do I know you? <laughs> and she lives in Portland. So I was like, oh, well, I'm a tattooer. I tattoo in Portland sometimes. It's you know, I've, I've been to a lot of your shows and she's like, no, that's not it. Why do I know you? <laughs> and then it came out that she had seen like the the hulu's like me on hulu and i was like oh my god my like favorite musician knows something so personal about me it was so surreal um but yeah it's been um i mean i've i i think i can i can't talk about like the details of it but um i mean i was on nightline and there's a a larger 2020 story that will be airing um, I can't say when. Um, and then there's a few documentaries that have reached documentarians that have reached out that I've um, that I've spoke to. I, I'm not really sure what that's going to look like moving forward and what I will have the capacity to participate in. Um, I know that this isn't going anywhere in terms of like how it affects my life. I don't know how much more like large scale conversation I can have when it at least about like the specificities of what happened um I do think that I would like to continue conversations about the um the culture at large 
how we can, um, what we can do, like what actionable steps we can start taking towards making sure these things don't happen. I mean, I know that there's no way of completely stopping it, but if there's any step forward we can take is a good step forward and an important one. Um, so yeah, being a part of a national news story is very bizarre. I don't, I mean, if if you can avoid it, I don't recommend it. <laughs> it's, very, it's very strange, but obviously like I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't regret sharing my story by any means. Um, but I also had no idea what that meant at the time. I had no context for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How could you? Like I, I accept offers sometimes to go on TV or documentaries or whatever, but it's only for the cause. It's, it's stressful. I always hate how I come off and I don't know. It's just something you do for the cause, yeah. but I, I would never call it enjoyable or something that I aspire to, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, like I said, I, I don't regret it at all. I don't regret coming forward. I, the amount of healing that has happened in my own life. And I, and I hope I can only hope that my story has helped even one person. Yeah. And I, and if me coming forward, if it, if it supports these children in any way, it's worth it. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's quite the experience. <laughs> Well, we're uh, we're all looking forward to you know those documentaries or that 2020 piece whenever it comes out. Just again for the cause, if for nothing else. But people love people find you to be very poised and articulate and intelligent and thoughtful. Um, so I, you know, more more Jesse Hildebrand is good <laughs> as far as our audience goes. Um, really quickly, Jesse, a couple more questions. What are your plans? Uh, do you have plans? Has your Mormon Stories interview, all the interviews from other people, just this whole situation, has it changed the trajectory of your life? What are your plans? People want to know if you are going to become a therapist. <laughs> People want to know if you're going to write a book. What is, are you able to share about your plans or do you even know? It's okay to not know. Yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, it has completely changed my life. And in, in, in so many ways. And the trajectory, I, I think it, I think it just, the, the, the shaping of the trajectory has, is definitely has happened. Um, I think it's more confirmed things for me because a lot of these things were, th were ideas that I have been ruminating on for a long time. Um, but the confirmation, the stories that I've received, the feedback that I've received has been very affirming and confirming to me. Um, the goal right now is I would, I'm trying to start school online <clears throat> for the, for like the time being. Um, I, I'm hoping to go into some form of psychology, sociology, neuroscience, some combination of those is as much as I am interested in individual healing and individual um, work, the collective, the collective work I think is, is equally as important and, and, and interesting to me um, specifically around these high, high demand like groups and exiting cults, exiting religions. Um, I think I may have mentioned the book before on the last time I was on, but there's this book called how minds change by David McCraney. He's great. Yeah. Love abs obsessed. Yeah. And that book was, I've, I mean, I've read all of his books and that one, but that one was so humanizing in a way that I, I feel like I haven't experienced in a while. Like it, it, it completely removes this moralistic um, lens from human behavior of good and bad you know, oh, the people, these people are bad, these people are good, and just shows like, really the lack of, um, or how complex our choices and decisions and how little control we have, or free, like how little like agency we have in a lot of ways. Um, but how important also it, that that book goes into showing how important outgroup empathy is, and how important 
especially as we become, we become more and more polarized, how offering a hand to people that are, that think differently than us. And I know that is difficult it is so, so difficult. Um, but as the only, as far as I can, as far as I gather from this book and books like it is the only way to actually like bring people over. And I think about, I actually think about this a lot. Um, when I, when I consider who I was when I first left the church, when I consider the thoughts and the behaviors and the beliefs that I had when I left, it's embarrassing. It's, it's like, I'm so grateful that I don't have like social media back then in, in the way that we do now of having everything documented. And I am so grateful for my friends that were so patient with me and so loving and so, and, and, and loving in, in a way that both felt safe and challenging. There is this one person, Brett Barrett. I, I mean, I feel like if it wasn't for him, I would not be the person I am today. And he was so willing to sit down with me and challenge me in a, such a kind and soft, gentle way and gave me books and resources and, and let me have my terrible takes. And then kind of sent me on with like a new way of thinking about things. If it wasn't for people like him, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be in this position of who I am today. I, it's a scary thought to think about who I would be. And so thinking about um, the forms of therapy and the forms of, of, and the types of conversations I want to be having moving forward, it's, it's those types of conversations. How do we bridge gaps? How do we bridge this mass polarization that's happening? Um, and how do we, how do we use ethical, ethical persuasive techniques like deep canvassing to help people come to those conclusions and um, come to better conclusions. It's a great book. Um, how minds change uh, Mormons, ex Mormons should read it for sure yes. because there are more and less effective ways to talk to your believing family and friends. And uh, we will always want to be effective uh, and not, and do no harm. Okay. So Jesse, you do plan on pursuing a, a, a therapy licensure. Did I hear that right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, potentially, I, I don't know in what direction I'm going to go. I want, the goal is to just start Okay. because I have no credits. And so okay. I like, I just want to start the process. Time's going to pass anyways. So I want to start the process. If that leads me to being a licensed therapist and working in like a clinical setting, wonderful. If that leads to more like research-based work, also wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but just as of right now, that's, that is where I, I would like to go. And like my job as a tattooer, there is a lot of therapeutic kind of work that happens. Like, obviously I know I'm not a therapist and th there's, I, I, have you, have you ever been tattooed? Have you had that experience before? No, but I have made the promise that if I do get tattooed. Okay. Be yes, that's you. right. So <laughs> there is a, so in the experience of getting tattooed, there's, I mean, there's so much trust. There is a, um, it's so intimate. It's so vulnerable. You are, putting your physical, the permanence of your physical being in the hands of this person. Um, and there's something about not only touching someone, but hurting. I mean, it's painful that just breaks this, breaks the ice and like forms a connection in ways that not many other things do. And so I'm with people for hours and I get to hear so many, like so much of their story. And usually there's a reason they're getting the tattoo or, why they're in town or where they're from. And like, there's <laughs> the amount of connection and bonding that I get to experience on a daily basis is just so incredible. It's my favorite part of my job. Like truly, if I had, if I woke up tomorrow and I physically couldn't tattoo, the thing that would be the hardest is, is losing that ability to connect with people in that way. So I think that desire for like being in the healing arts has, it's been there for a long time. Um, so like getting a degree in that way just feels like a natural extension of that. Okay. 
And you, are you, are you starting with undergrad then? And yeah. Then, okay. So you're you're at the undergrad phase. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Well, we wish you luck, and and I'm sure there's lots of people that want to support you in in whatever way they can. We'll get to that. What some people are saying, they would love you to give a TED talk. Not that it's <laughs> giving you assignments. Others are saying they would love to. I'm sure that there would be some agents out there that would love to shop a memoir around. Have you where where are you thinking about these days on things like a book or a TED talk? <laughs> I mean the the idea of like having something of value to say to like warrant a TED talk is very wild to yeah. think about. Um, if I, I <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> um, um, in terms of a book, I, I mean, that is definitely something that I, I think I would like to do in the future. I don't really know what the nature of that book would be. If that would be, surrounding my experience with Jody, if it would be more of like a fictionalized um, kind of memoir novel kind of story, if it would be nothing even related to that and more about just like um, the work that I want to do in regards to um, in, in regards to healing from severe trauma. Um, I don't know what that would look like, but that is definitely something that I would like to do. Okay. That's good to hear. Um and TED Talks are easier than books. I, I, I've, I've done a TED Talk. I've not been able to do a book. <laughs> just so you know, TED Talks are easier than books. I don't, um, there's something about a TED Talk that just sounds like, oh, no, only like famous people do TED Talks. Uh, only like people that have something to say do TED Talks. Like, not little old me. Like, no, for sure you could, get, <laughs> you could do a TED Talk, especially if you do TEDx. TEDx is like with the local university or oh, yeah. you like University of Utah, Utah State. You know, I'm sure... University of Washington as a TED, a TEDx kind of thing. So you can start at a TEDx and then graduate to a TED talk, but you'd be fantastic, but that's totally up to you. Um, I, I will ask this just because it's what I, you know, realm I care about. Are you open to, or have you considered like a YouTube channel, like interviewing people like we do on Mormon Stories or just, you know, talking about uh, what you learned? Kind of like, I'm Jesse, I'm pursuing the healing arts and mental health come along with me on the ride as I learn. And as I, as I, as I progress into hopefully a therapist someday or, or something like it, have you thought about a YouTube channel? I have. Yes. <laughs> I, um, it's, it, it's, it's pretty scary to think about and, and exciting at the same time. I mean, these are the, like, these are the types of conversations that I really want to, I really want to start having. Um, I don't know if it's like, if me hosting it is the way, or if I like find people that are already having these conversations and join the conversation. Um, I think there's a little bit of imposter syndrome of like all of the healing I've done has been very much just trial and error. And so and not having any sort of credit. I mean, I'm a high school dropout, like, and I know that intellect and educate, I know that there, that doesn't, I cognitively understand that doesn't mean anything, but it, there is like a level of insecurity around that. Um, and so like having, I think credentials and having at least starting that path, I think I would feel a little bit more um, inclined or like, like able to have those conversations. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not going to push you at all. However, <laughs> if, um, you know, if you ever do want to start a YouTube channel, I, I know I'd love to support that. And I know there's a lot of people who would step up to support you. So well, you, you decide whatever feels right to you. Just know that I and others would, would love to support you in any way we can. Well, there is, I haven't said anything yeah, and I probably won't say anything for a little while, but there is potentially some pretty big shifts happening in my life in the next six months. And so I'm trying to like let those things settle before making any sort of decisions on, on that. But I do see myself having some sort of platform and of, of talk, like having conversations with people because I know that there are so many people out there that have these ideas and either are a part of the conversation already or want to be a part of the conversation and I think that the more and more we normalize these types of conversations, 
um, the more effective and the, like the, the faster we can get our message out of, of healing and love and support, you know, just like healing from these, from these atrocities. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, my daughter, Maya, um, as she, she has lots and lots of tattoos and she adores you and your voice. <laughs> and, uh, it's not often that what I do on my podcast really reaches my kids, but Maya was very grateful that I helped introduce her to you. And now she follows you. Uh, and it's because she finds you wise. So I'm sure a lot of other people will. So I'm grateful to know there may be a platform in your future. Well, thank you. That means yeah. so much. Okay. Well, I promise to keep you to two hours, but I do want to end by plugging, uh, by plugging you like last time I'm going to just quickly share your Venmo. Um, oh, John. <laughs> Jesse Tattooer, right? It's J E S S I T A T T O O E R. Is that right? Yes. And is that also your, your, uh, that's your, that's your Instagram as well. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. And, uh, really quickly, how was Europe? Do you have any tips on while people are, um, taking advantage of, uh, of, uh, that Venmo share, uh, really quickly, how was Europe? Europe was amazing. What were some highlights? I mean, <laughs> it was, I mean, oh. Everything, every, every part of my trip was just magic. There was so much serendipity. There was so much connection. I was able, two of my best friends flew out for my birthday. And then we met more of our friends in um, this place called The Hague in the Netherlands for a music festival. And I was able to see so many of my friends' bands play. And then we all went rock climbing. And then just the museums. And I low-key fell in love. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just it's been it was just it was magic and people that were listening helped make that possible and so truly from the bottom of my heart i i have thank you and just continuously humbled by this what what countries are you are you comfortable sharing what countries you visited yeah so in the uk i just i went to london and then london and bath and then I was in Berlin and I was in um, Amsterdam, Eindhoven, The Hague, Bordeaux, Paris. And I was in, but I was in Berlin twice and I was in London twice. Yeah, I think that's everything but, uh, for this trip. That's called travel therapy. That's what that is. Yeah, it's tra travel therapy. And I'll be back. I'm actually going back to Berlin in like nine days for a week. <laughs> and then I'll be back. And then I'm going to be back in May for a tattoo convention called True Blue. So if anyone is in Europe and wants to get tattooed, you should let me know because I'd love to. What is your tattoo shop in Seattle if you want to let people know? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's called Electric Cobra. Um, we are located in Columbia City in Seattle. Um, it's just Electric Cobra tattoo par parlor, but it's like fancy parlor spelling. <laughs> Um, yeah, I would, I would love to tattoo if anyone is in town or, um, is around and wants to get tattooed. I would absolutely love that. All right. And the Instagram is Jesse Tattooer, J-E-S-S-I-T-A-T-T-O-O-E-R. And that's both the Venmo and the Instagram. Um, <laughs> what's wrong with that? <laughs> oh, it's no nothing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank oh you. yeah. Of course. And thanks to all the viewers and listeners that support Jesse. Uh, Jesse deserves our support. Um, the book that Jesse's been holding up again, for those who didn't see it, it's called Recovering Agency. I'll, I'll show Recovering Agency by Luna Lindsay, um, lifting the veil of Mormon mind control. You can check out, I believe, yeah, thumbs up by Jesse. You can check out the five-part, I believe, series we have on Mormon Stories Podcast with Luna uh, Lindsay. They're fantastic. Uh, you mentioned so many books. I think I'm sure uh, that Julia is going to be listing those books and resources in the show notes, along with the time codes. 
Um, so thanks to to Julia and and Maven for moderating the chats as always. Gerardo for the thumbnails, all the Mormon Story staff. Thanks to all the donors that make this podcast possible. You can become a donor at mormonstories.org if you want to um, see this program continue. Jesse, I want to give you the chance to give any final words of hope or advice or perspective or condemnation, whatever <laughs> whatever you want to say to to conclude. The floor is now yours. Just thank you, truly, everyone. That I had no, I had no clue what going on this podcast what is going to be like and what the the reactions were going to be. I had no context for it, and just completely changed my life and changed. I mean, you changed so much. And in in terms of of, of hope, um, embrace the joy as much like embrace the pain and embrace the joy because they go together and don't block your joy because you are also in pain. I know that it's really easy to do that, but the more and more that we allow ourselves to feel joy, the, the less that they win. So beautiful, yeah. <laughs> beautiful. And, uh, and I guess the final sentencing of Jody and Ruby is still to come. Yeah, uh, that story's not yet written. So I mean, at some point, if if you if you have any final or, or additional updates, we'd love right. to have you back. But I'm sure there's at some point you're going to want to leave the story behind you too. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm hoping that the next time we talk about the sentencing, that it's a a really positive conversation, a very short and very. You know, <laughs> I hope that I hope that there's not going to be a lot to say about it. That it's just going to be like, okay, justice is served. Um, I have to ask this question because it's from a friend. This will be my last question. My friend Lauren Johnson Matthias from uh, Hidden True Crime Podcast. She's a legend. Her and her husband, Dr. John, are amazing. They do great work. They've covered your story. I don't know if you know Lauren or Hidden True Crime, but they're, check them out, uh, listeners and Jesse as well, if you don't. Um, but But Lauren asked me to ask you this. Um, Ruby apologized to Pam during her sentencing statement, but Jesse told KUTV that Pam was Jody's best friend and that Pam was the president of Connections. I don't even know, Jesse, if any of this means anything to you, but Lauren wanted me to ask if you had any thoughts on Ruby's apology to Pam, which is kind of a geeky question, but, uh, you know, I thought I, I love Lauren, so I'm going to ask. Um... I actually don't remember the part about Pam. I mean, I, I know Pam and I have very strong feelings about Pam and I, they're not, and not positive feelings. Um, so I, I guess I, I, I think I missed the part about Pam um, in the, in the apology. Oh yeah. I, I think it, I think it may have just been like, thank you, Pam, for your support or, you know, that, that sort of thing. I mean, I have, I, I, I mean, I think in my experience with Pam, uh, I mean, she was very, she saw the abuse that was going on in my life with me and other people in, at the hands of Jody, And she was very much a part of Jody's inner workings and inner worlds and made a lot of things possible. I have nothing, nothing good to say about Pam. Okay. Okay. So if, uh, if Jody, um, if Ruby's apologizing to Pam, that probably isn't feeling super good. No, not, okay. not, not great. Okay. All right. Well, I don't mean to end on a downer. This has been something uplifting episode, but I love Lauren. So I had to ask Lauren's question. No, I, I understand. Okay. All right. Well, Jesse Hildebrandt, uh, you're the best. We're so <laughs> thank you for coming on Mormon stories. Thank you for your courage your grace, your wisdom, your intelligence, and uh, and for all the good that's going to come in the future, we wish you so much luck. And uh, we, get, we got your back, and you're always welcome here on Mormon Stories. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. All right. Now you go have a good relax. Whatever you do to relax and to chill out and heal. Yes. You know. I'm going to make soup, and I'm going <laughs> to eat bagels, and I'm going to go to sleep, and it's going to be great. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, you take care. You too. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today on Mormon Stories. We really appreciate the support. Again, 
please, uh, thanks if you donate to us. And if you um, want to support the program, please go to mormonstories.org and become a monthly donor. Thanks to everyone who makes this possible. Please subscribe to Mormon Stories Podcast on YouTube and Facebook. Please like and share this episode. Please spread the word. And um, thanks to everyone for your support. We'll have lots of good shows in the weeks and months ahead. Be good to each other. Be kind to each other. We'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. And check out, we'll let you know when anything good comes out about Jesse. We'll make sure to let you know on the podcast as well. Thanks, everybody. Uh, everyone take care.